Can I tell you a cat joke? Just kidding. You know, things like that. Yeah, okay. All right, Luke chapter number two. <laughs> Luke, Luke chapter number two. We're going to talk about the message of the empty tomb, and uh, let's st- start, with, start with me in Luke 24, because that's really the text where we're, where we're going to be. And, and again, it's uh, great to, to be here. I'll say hello from the saints in, uh, in, in, in Arizona. There, um, I was looking around. We have several of our folks are here for the weekend and so forth, and there was actually several others coming and then they got sick with the flu bug and some other plans got changed and so forth. So uh, Luke chapter 24 here, let's just get into this. Uh, now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing spices that which they had prepared and certain other, others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and, uh, the, and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of the sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered... His words, and returned from the sepulcher, and told all these things unto the eleven, and to all the rest. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord, and as we begin to look here at your empty tomb, and the signal and the message that it, that it sends, that we would just pay close attention to it, and we would just rejoice when the angels say, He's not here, but He's risen. And we'll just give you the honor and the glory, in your name we pray, Amen. It's an interesting thing, we end the life of Christ with a message from an angel. We started Luke 2, so look over at Luke 2 real quick. We start the Lord's life with messages from the angels. Angel Gabriel talks to Joseph and Mary. In Luke 2, verse 8, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the, uh, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. What's the angel say in the tomb? Don't worry, guys. He's not here. He's risen. So when you come back, so we, we're, we're, we start the Lord's life with a message from the angels of fear not. We end the Lord's life with a message of fear not. He's not here. He's risen. Everything's good. I want you to know, go back to Luke 24. I want you to notice something here. In, in, in the message of the empty tomb, it's going to impact Israel, we're going to look at that, and it impacts you and I, and we're going to quickly look at that. I was told I had all morning, I mean just a little bit of time this morning, so we're only going to skim. I'm just going to try to give you some things for you to think about, for you to go be the Berean, look into a little deeper, because there is so much in the message of the tomb. For the nation of Israel, first of all, what the tomb is going to do is it's going to validate Look at verse 8, Luke 24, 8. And they remembered his, what? Words. The tomb, the empty tomb is going to validate for Israel his words to them. They remembered his words. He's going to do some things that he's going to begin to tell them and has been telling them since the beginning. Notice verse 1. 24.1, first word, now. Things have changed. Something's happened. Things aren't going along like they are. What did we just have? We just had the crucifixion of their Messiah. We just had the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's been taken down. His body has been laid in the grave. As they're walking, you read the other accounts in the Gospels as they're going to the tomb, they're worried about how to get the stone rolled away. Now you think about, he's told them he's going to rise again on the third day. They're worried about how they're going to get into seeing. They didn't quite catch what was going on, did they? They didn't understand some things. It doesn't mean they didn't believe him, they just don't understand him. It's often an interesting thing when you look at Israel and the Word of God goes, especially in Wednesday night at home we're studying the Gospel of John. There is many times in John they look at him with that perplexed look of, huh? 
It doesn't mean they don't believe Him. They just don't understand Him. They're perplexed. They hurt Him. They, you know, Peter looks over there, and Peter, bless Peter's heart, Philip, you ever think about Philip and John, Philip asked a question, Lord, show us some more stuff and we'll believe, you know, that you're the, Philip, he's like, Philip, I've been with you since, the, you've been with me since the beginning, don't you get this? It's not that Philip didn't believe that he was Jesus the, the Messiah, he just didn't understand. Well, there's some misguided, look at verse 5, look at, look at the question at the end of that verse. As they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among... Boy, isn't that the question of the ages? It's what we've been looking at all weekend. He's not here, he's alive. Come over, hold on to John 24. But look over at John... I'm, I'm sorry, Luke 24. Look at John 20. An interesting thing here. I, as I was sitting and... and <laughs> I started working on this message, and the next thing I know, I had 25 pages of information. So now where do you start cutting and start whittling down? Look at John 20 and verse number 9. Why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? They remembered His words. Look at John 20 verse 9. For as yet they knew not the Scripture that He must rise again from the dead. But yet Luke 24 says, what did they remember? They remembered His words. You know what they begin to remember? Go back to Luke 24. They begin to remember that He's been telling them some things, hasn't He? Come back to Luke 9. By the way, in the whittling down, I tried to stay in the same book so you weren't flipping all over. Didn't work. Luke 9. Luke chapter 9. Look at Luke 9. What has He been telling them? Luke chapter 9, verse 22. Luke 9, 22. Saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and scribes, be slain and raised the third day. Now, we're not looking at the context. I just want you to see, what has He been telling them? He's been telling them he, He's got to go down there, He's got to die, He's going to be buried, and He's going to resurrect. Look at Luke 18. This one is a killer. Look, look at Luke 18. If you think that Peter... And the boys were preaching the same thing as Paul and the guy and the boys. Then you don't you haven't read Luke eighteen thirty one to thirty four. Luke eighteen, look at th verse thirty one to thirty four. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spit it on, and they shall scourge him and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. And they got it, they understood it, they praised the Lord, they had a wonderful time together in fellowship. They understood what? None of this. None of these things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which he spake, and it came to pass. I mean, you, you read other, other uh, accounts, Peter and the guys are like, what in the world is he talking about? Let's go, go ask him. And they're like, I ain't going to ask him. <laughs> you ask him. No, you, you chicken. You know, And they're arguing. And I'll come back to Luke 24. They didn't get it, but at this event, when they get there and the tomb is empty, what do they begin to remember? His words. What has he been telling them? Now look down in Luke 24. He's not here. He's risen. We're in Luke 24. He's no longer there any longer. Now drop all the way down to verse 44 in Luke 24. Now some events have happened. And, he, and we're going to talk some about that next, uh, my next hour in the 11 o'clock hour, and where he's appeared to some folks and they've had some encounters. But I want you to, he, they go to the tomb. He's not here, he's risen. They remember his words. They don't understand. They just know what? He told us. He said it. Now look at verse 44. Then he said unto them, These are the words. Emphasis there. By my, you need to emphasize that too. In other words, he didn't make this story up. Peter t says later, We went down there and, and, and we were eyewitnesses to the counts. And we didn't tell you stories and make stuff up to make us look at We actually saw this. The Lord looks at them and says, What you're going to be trusting in are my 
words. They are truth. They're what set you free. They're what sanctify you, is what I'm telling you. But notice what he says. Which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. Luke 9, Luke 18, and other places, by the way. And all these things, uh, while I was yet with you, that all things must be... The empty tomb, number one, fulfills Scripture. Fulfills the words. All fulfilled that were spoken of, that were written, I'm sorry, in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and off they go. Now what's happening? Light bulbs go on, heaven opens, angels sings, they got it. But look at verse 44. All the things that were written at where? The law of Moses. All right, I guess I am going to use this. Fulfilled. It's not working very good. The law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, right? The three major components of Israel's Bible. Come back to Genesis chapter 3. Here's the law. Genesis chapter number 3. Here's the law of Moses. Moses writes the first five books. We're going to have to do this quickly. uh, Otherwise, we'll just look at Israel and I'll have to say what I want you to look at about us. But you you need to understand when when he says this stuff to them, he's not pulling things out of thin air. Genesis 3, verse 15. What's the promise made to the, the curse given to the adversary? That's 315. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. What do we have there? As the Lord looks at the adversary, he makes him a promise. You know what's coming? The seed of the woman. And you guys are going to have enmity. You're going to have conflict. And when the seed of the woman shows up, you know what he's going to do? He's going to win. So what do we have that begins to happen in human history? Come over to Numbers chapter 21. Literally, folks, I tell you what, you get Numbers 21, you begin to look, and you're the law. And there's that thing about the seed line, isn't there? Now real quickly, what is... What does Satan do, by the way? Do you remember how he begins to dilute the seed of of the woman? The the sons of God leave their natural habitation, come down to the sons of the daughters of Noah and they begin to, of man, and they begin to have giants. And you know what he's doing now? He's polluting the seed line. But God says, that's okay, we got Abraham. We'll take care of this. You got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, don't you? Jacob's got 12 boys. They become the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. That's a lot of people. You, you listen to the numbering in the, in the book of the Numbers, and there's a lot of people. But he does what? That's okay, we're going to have one tribe, Judah. And then one tribe, now Judah's a big tribe, biggest tribe they got. Well, we've got one family, the family of Jesse, and David, and David, and Seedline. See, he spelled, yeah, it's amazing. God Almighty is not worried about the adversary because he told him where all this is coming from. Here is what I'm going to do. And you know what? In the end, you're still going to lose. Nan, nan, and boo, boo. (laughs) Put them up. Let's go. Look at Numbers 21. Look at verse 8. Numbers 21, verse 8. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. You know the story, I hope. But what did he just tell Moses to do? Make a serpent, fiery serpent, put it up on a pole. Those bitten, look, and what are they going to do? Shall what? Shall live. Come over to John. Quickly now, quickly. John, hold on to, well, you need Deuteronomy 18, but you need John 3 first. John 3. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Look at what the Lord says about that event. Moses 
gave the event was the event's a histor historical event. It happened. Look at John. Am I scratching? No? Okay. My coat is? All right. There we go. You got John 3. Look at verse... All right, there we go. John 3, look at verse 13. And no man hath ascended up into heaven, and he that come down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, where was that? Numbers 21, right? Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Isn't that interesting? You know what the Lord says? What Moses was talking about in picture is me. Look at the next verse. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting what? life. What did Numbers 21 tell you? you? Moses, put that thing up there. Anybody that looks at it shall live. The Lord says, man, what Moses is talking about is me. So the words that I'm telling you guys is me. Deuteronomy chapter number 18 and get Acts chapter 3. It's just Saturday morning. You didn't have anywhere else to be. We can do a little Bible study. Okay? If you, Deuteronomy 18 and Acts chapter 3. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15 through 19. Deuteronomy 18, 15. Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken, according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, let, not, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. And the Lord spake, said unto me, they, will, uh, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto the words, unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. You see all that stuff there about a prophet and all that? Now look at Acts 3. Acts 3, verse 22. Acts 3, verse 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you, of your brethren, like unto me. He shall, him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. You see how Peter quotes that? Do you know who Peter's referencing? Christ, verse 20. And he, shall send, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which was before preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive, and so forth. You know, who, you know what Moses is talking about? He's talking about Christ. The Lord, resurrected, stands up there and says, Look, guys, I've been telling you everything that's going on, so Scripture will be fulfilled. Moses has been talking about me. I could have showed you one verse in John where he says Moses was talking about me, but I want you to see... When he talks about the empty tomb, the message coming out is that, hey, he's not here, he's risen. And what that did was it fulfilled some scripture in the law of Moses. What's the next list? The prophets. Isaiah chapter 7. Quickly. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're not going to get through all this. I tell you, folks, it is unbelievable when you begin to look at it. Isaiah 7 and verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. What does Matthew 1.21 tell Mary and Joseph? Who's coming? You're going to call his name Jesus. He's going to be Emmanuel, God with us. Here he comes. I fulfilled that, guys. I'm there. Chapter 11 of Isaiah. Again, I tried to pick one book, okay? Because you can literally do this in almost every prophet is talking about the Lord coming. Isaiah 11, verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod of, out of the stem of Jesse and a branch, capital B, his title, right? He's the branch. Shall grow out of his roots. Where is he coming from? Jesse, David, the seed line. Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, verse 1. 
Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Seek ye comfortably, uh, speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her, and her warfare, uh, warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Who's that turn out to be? There's John the Baptist, right? Look at verse 9. O Zion, that, that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringeth, uh, that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, behold your... There he is. What does John do? Prepare the way. Here he comes. The Lord says, I'm here. <laughs> behold your God. You go into Zechariah, time-wise, and you know what he says? Well, look, look, look at Isaiah 50. Isaiah 50. He says, behold your servant. Actually, that's in Isaiah. But get Isaiah 50. I'm trying to talk about the death, burial, and resurrection. I, Isaiah 50. You start there in verse number 2. Isaiah 50, verse 2. Wherefore, when I... When I came, was there no man? When I called, was there none to answer? Is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, at my rebuke I dry up the sea, I make the rivers a wilderness. Their fish stinketh, because there is no water, and, die, and dieth for thirst. Look at that. Now, that's the Lord coming, isn't it? When I come. Now look at verse 6. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. What, where did that happen? That's the cross. That's the only way you know that that's what happened is that verse. So where did he move? He goes, man, when I get down there, I'm going to do this. But you know what? I had to do this over here first. Look at verse 8. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Who's his arch enemy? Now we're back to Genesis 3, aren't we? And the enmity and the adversary. Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near. The battle's on, isn't it? Calvary, three hours of spiritual darkness. But who's he looking at? Isaiah. He says, man, the prophets were talking about me. Chapter 53, or well, you can look in 52. You start in 52 there, you start in verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal uh, prudently. Verse 14, and as many uh, were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of men. What did they do with him leading him to Calvary? They scourged him, didn't they? His visage was marred. Chapter 53, the whole chapter is about what he's doing for the nation of Israel on Calvary's tree. Jeremiah 23. It's an interesting thing. He stands after the resurrection and he says, Guys, everything that Moses told you about, I fulfilled. Everything that the prophets talked about, I fulfilled. Jeremiah 23, verse number 5, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice. Where? In the earth. Again, you can run to, to Daniel 9. In Daniel 9, as he describes the 70th week and how it's going to break out, he says the 69 weeks end with the cutting off of the... Messiah. Isaiah 53 says the cutting off of the Messiah is Calvary. He stands, that empty tomb, he stands there. Come over to Psalm 16. Because the next one is the Psalms, isn't it? Psalm 16. And this one is actually a verse that was given to me, a chapter to look at. I looked at this chapter and I said, oh, why bother? Where do you start? Where do you stop? But look in, look in Psalm 16, there's only 11 verses, and you think, ah, oh, that's pretty easy, but it ain't easy being cheesy. <laughs> it just isn't going to work, okay? Look at Psalm 16, verse 1, Preserve me, O God, for in thee I put my trust. Wow, David talking here. But who's David really talking about? 
Christ. He says, uh, the Lord says there, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I am but a worm. Man, Father, why would you turn your back? Why aren't you speaking to me? I cry and you don't answer me. Now, that's RJ's version, okay? Oh, my soul that thou hast said unto the Lord, thou art my Lord, my goodness extended not to thee. Oh, look at that, extended not to thee. Drop down to verse 9. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in, in what? In hope. Hope of what? What did the Father tell the Son to, would happen? You go do this and I'll take care of you over here. Amen. You do what I need you to do. We'll take care of that. And the Spirit comes along and puts a seal of a stamp of approval on it. What did the Father say to the Son? I'll resurrect you. For thou will not... By the way, this is how you know that's what he said. For thou will not leave my soul where? In hell. Neither will thou suffer thy Holy One to see what? What's the corruption in a reference to? His body. Because where does your body go back to? To the dirt. Job says, though worms eat my body. What's, where, where, you know what was protected? Was the, the Lord's whole being and humanity. When the ladies get there and the tomb is opened, they only see the grave linen clothes. There was no body laying there. Why? Because Psalm 16 says, you aren't going to see corruption. Verse 11, thou will show me the path of life. What kind of life? Resurrection life. In thy presence is the fullness of... What kind of... I don't know if you've ever thought about the heavenly places for you and I. Is it going to be joyful or gloom and doom and woe is me? Give me a little joy. Absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, isn't it? Okay? What do you think the joy for Israel was going to be? This is an Israel passage. It's going to be the same thing. Those guys were... They, Hebrews 11, Abraham, they die not receiving the promise, but what were they looking for? They saw it afar off and they were rejoicing in it. That's how they could die not worrying about it. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Well, the empty tomb for Israel, you know what he says? I fulfilled Scripture. And you know what Scripture said? You know what the law of Moses said? Your Messiah is coming. I'm, I, I'm him. You know what the prophet said? Your king and redeemer and avenger is coming. He says, I'm him. You know what the psalm says? By the way, you can go look at Psalms 22. You can go look at Psalms 69. You can go look at Psalms 88, 109, 118, a few others that I can't remember right now. And you know what they say? He's going to live. Just what Psalm 16 says. The, empty, the message from the empty tomb for Israel was, your Messiah just walked amongst you, and he fulfilled everything that Scripture says ever said. And you begin to see that. Come over with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. After the, the ascension of the Lord, Peter stands on the day of Pentecost, does he not? And he preaches a little bit to the nation of Israel, to the men gathered there. And in Acts 22, he says, you, uh, Acts 2, verse 22. <laughs> okay, the deuces are wild. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you as yourselves also, what? They know. When they looked at what he did, John says the things that the Lord did, if they were to written, it would have filled up the world. He couldn't write it all down. They knew. Boy, what a bunch of hypocrites when they look at him and say, just show us one more and we'll believe you. He's like, dude, man, what do I got to do to you guys? I've emptied out every sick room in the place. And you want me to do more? 
Peter looks at them and he says, verse 23, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God hath ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Notice Peter doesn't stop there. And whom God hath raised up. There's Psalm 16. Having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Verse 27, because thou wilt not leave my soul in heaven. There's Psalm 16. Neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. You know what Peter does? Peter reaches back over into Psalms and says, you know what Psalm 16 is talking about? You know who he's talking about? He's talking about the guy you just killed over there as a rebel and a, and a troublemaker. And you know who he was? I am the resurrection and the life. As he says in John. You see, folks, come over to Romans 1. The message in the tomb to the nation of Israel was, I have, I'm your Messiah. I've fulfilled all the Scripture about me. When the Lord looked up and he's, before He gave up the ghost and says, it is finished, that's a big statement, by the way. It's like when people say the second coming. Do you know there's like 12 things that He does in His second coming? Not just one thing coming back. There is so much in that it is finished. The war is over, the song says. The battle is raging. It is finished. The souls it's done. But you know what else was finished? All of the prophetic scripture from the law and the prophets, it's all been accomplished. That talked about him coming, meek and lowly the first time. What's coming? You, you remember when the Lord stands in the synagogue, and he reads Isaiah, and then he stops right at the right spot. What's yet to be fulfilled? The future stuff. It is finished. I think when the Lord comes back and he gets all done and he's going to resurrect those saints in there and they get all up in there and they're going into the... He finally, under his breath, will say, it's finished. <laughs> you know? Scripture doesn't say that. I, it's, I think that, okay? But look at Romans 1. Because what is the message to you and I? What does the temple, or what does that empty tomb mean and say to you and I? Well, I'm just going to pause here and say, see John and Dad's message last night, okay? <laughs> but I want you to look at Romans 1. Because Paul picks up on some things. Look at Romans 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, I'm sorry, a servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. Parenthesis, which he had promised afford by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The Gospel of God, verse 3, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to flesh, and what? Declared. You know what, the son of, you know what God the Father did? He declared his Son. He declared Jesus Christ to be the Son of God with power. How did he declare Jesus Christ to be the Son of God? He did it with power, didn't he? But what gave him the right to do that? According to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. You know what Paul says? You know who the guy who gave me my authority? Is the guy that God the Father said is my son in whom I am well pleased. And what gave God the Father the right to say it was the resurrection from the dead. In John, the Lord says to him, he says, I lay my life down. I take it up, pick it up. You know how, you know how I can do that? Because the Father gave me the rights to do that. Because I'm up here doing his will, not my will. I'm up here doing what he wants done. Paul picks up on where his authority is coming from. It wasn't some guy in the back room of a, of a gym joint or a bar or something, you know, or a speakeasy or the back end of a church building. He says, no, I got my authority from the guy that the Father says is the one. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2. It's an interesting thing, the message here. And I think this is where we need to be careful when we go give the gospel. What, is the, what are the three components of the gospel? Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. Sometimes we slip up on the resurrection thing. And we just say it real quick and move on. Because we're after the dying for their sins. 
But what validates him dying for the sins? The resurrection does. Look at 2 Timothy 2, look at verse 7. Concerning what I say, consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. Remembering that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to... Oh, wait a minute, that's not the law and the prophets in Moses, or in the Psalms, is it? But that's what Jesus said in Luke 24. Paul says, hang on a minute, boys. What was the gospel in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? The gospel of the kingdom. Paul says, man, the gospel today is the good news that Christ was, he died for our sins according to the scripture, was buried and rose again the third day. According to what? The scriptures. That empty tune message is singing the same to you, that you know who he is? He is who he said he was, the Son of God. And the death, burial, and resurrection, Paul says, that now becomes known to whom? Come back to Romans 1. Well, you're, are you still in 2 Timothy? All right, look there. But you need 1 Timothy. Now... The message of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection goes to who? 1 Timothy 2, 4. Who will have how many men? All men. There's Paul's my gospel. Paul's good news, the message of the good news, now I'll go back to Romans 1, was to who? To all. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1, 16. Romans 1, verse number 4, how was he declared to be the Son of God with power? By the resurrection. Now the resurrection is going to be applied to what? To you and I, as we trust the gospel of Christ. By the way, without the resurrection, we believe, then we would be no better off than anybody else. We would be, as we'll see a little bit later, in 1 Corinthians 15, most men... Miserable. Actually, you know what? Go over there. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. You see, folks, the empty tomb for you and I holds the same as it does for Israel. Because who came up? He's not here. Who's the he? The Son of God. The one that Paul says appeared to me on the road to Damascus and gave my message so that for the faith and the obedience of all nations. Now, that empty tomb comes along and Paul says, you need to pay attention. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I delivered unto you first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, and then of the twelve, and that He was seen of above 500 brethren. There's some confirmation, isn't there? We're not, we're not in the fairy tales and the stories. He's seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greatest part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, and then of all the apostles. Last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born, I love that, out of due time. I wasn't supposed to be here, but I was here. I'm an interruption in the program. And you know what I'm preaching to you? You know what the message that you're paying attention to? Is that Christ did what? He died, he was buried, and he rose again. For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I but the grace of God which was with me. Wow, the witness. Paul says the empty tomb witness and the witness of the events after the fact. That's my, after David's message, okay. Verse 12, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead. When Paul says we preach Christ crucified, there's three pieces in the crucifixion, isn't there? There's the death, the burial, and the resurrection. When Paul says, uh, first, you're in 1 Corinthians, hold chapter 15, go back and look at verse in chapter 1. 
When, when Paul says, verse 18, 118, for the preaching of the cross, I hope you're preaching all three pieces. The death, burial, and resurrection. Because the resurrection is what puts the seal of agreement that the guy that's got the power and the authority to do that, he's the firstborn. He did it. He's the one, as 1 Timothy 6 says, with only with immortality. He's the first one. Go back, if you will, to chapter 15, quickly here. Verse 12, How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Isn't that an interesting question? If you believe that, your condition is verse number 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, do we have hope in Christ? I hope you do. If you're here today and you have no hope in Christ, then you need to go meet Christ and get some hope. The world about us today, you see the accident up on I-10, you see the shootings that are going on and all this mess. By the way, people, oh, it's the worst life's ever been. No, it hasn't. Go read the history books of Rome and other great countries. We're just magnified because we have a little news cycle that's 24 hours a day. It's just pumped into you more. Uh, anyway. <laughs> We're all men most what? Miserable. If you don't have hope in Christ, you know what you are? You're miserable. Well, but, but Rick, I, I'm a saved guy, but I just don't believe I've erred concerning the truth and resurrection's path. You know what you are? You're miserable. Yeah. That's what you are. Ah, but you know what, Rick? How can you prove it? You know how I can prove it? The Word of God says. Amen. I told, they remembered His words. Verse 14. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and our faith is also vain. Look at, the, look at what the message sends to you if you don't believe that the resurrection happened. It's interesting. You pay attention to people, and you talk to people, and you know what there's an onslaught on? His word. Well-meaning people, and you know what they're doing? They're questioning his word. You know what his word is? I died, I was buried, and I rose again. And the message that comes out of the empty tomb, come to Romans. Where are we at here? Oh, okay, five minutes. You guys got 15, right? Romans 6. Romans 6. I'm just scratching the surface. When Paul says in, in Galatians 6, you need Romans 6, okay? He says in Galatians 6, God, uh, verse 14, For God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. When he says save in the cross, he's talking about all three components. One is no less important than the other. They all have to be there. Look at Romans 6. Wonderful passage. You ought to... I, I, I try to tell folks at, at home, and you know, privately mostly, you ought to fall in love with Romans 6, 7, and 8. I mean, I know we love Romans 5 and 4 and 3, 21 to the end. We don't care about Romans 1, 18 to 3, 20, you know, and I, that's all the bad stuff, you know. But you ought to fall in love with Romans 6. What shall we say then? By the way, when somebody says that to you, what shall we say then? I hope you better answer Romans 4, verse 3. What saith the Scripture? That's what we're going to say. Verse 3, Romans 6, verse 3. What's those first three words? No, you're not. No, you're not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His what? When you went to Calvary and you trust and you said, I do to your Savior, you know what you just were identified with? His death. Verse 4. Therefore we are, what? Buried. Buried. You know what you just identified with? His burial, didn't you? That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in, there's His resurrection. The newness of life. We're to walk where, folks? In the newness of His life. 
resurrection life. For if we've been planted, verse 5, together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his... Just in case you didn't know what newness of life was. See. Knowing this, what do we know? We have a co-identity in his death, burial, and resurrection, don't we? we? Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Verse 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Does he die anymore? Why doesn't he die? He's been resurrected. From the death, death uh, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. How many times have you died to sin? One time. You have an identity in who? Christ. How many times did Christ die for sin? Once. You know what that means? 1 John 1, 9 goes out of your vocabulary. Confessing your sins, you know. No, you've been forgiven. Amen. That word in verse 7, for he that is dead is... Ah, read that again. It's got a D on the end of that word. Freed. It's past tense. It is done. Why? Because what does the next verse say? If we be dead with Christ... I'm sorry, verse um, 10. He died how many times to sin? One time. Isn't that an interesting thing? What a message to come out of the tomb, the empty tomb. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Wow, isn't that an interesting thing to think about? I mean, I know we struggle with sin. We got that old sin nature. I got that. Don't get me wrong. I struggle with it too. Sometimes. But I'm going to tell you what. What does is, what is your identity in Christ say? One time done. And you have the opportunity to now go live unto who? Live unto God. Likewise reckon, verse 11, ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Folks, the message of the empty tomb to you and I is that the one that we trust to take care of our sins and our sin says, I did that. I gave you an identity totally and completely. You're complete in Him. Now I need you to go live for me. Live in that resurrected life. Isn't that fantastic? You can live as a resurrect, in that resurrection life right here, right now, in this old, present evil world. Because what is our job? Ambassador. You walk in, you see the ambassador lady to the UN? You know why those guys run from her? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Think about not so much the politics. I'm not talking about the politics. You know why they run from her? Because when she walks in, do you know who they know walked in with her? President Trump and the government that she represents. Now, she's got politics. I got that. But they know when she speaks, guess what's going to happen? She's got the full authority of the administration behind her. When you speak, you know what people need to know? That you have the full authority of the head guy, the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because you're speaking for them. And you know what they would do? 1 Corinthians 1.18, we'll be done. Again, very quickly, I'm... For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. I realize personalities are completely different in this room. Praise the Lord for that. If you were all like me, we'd all be having a gr greater time. But, uh, okay, not really. <laughs> you have to take your ambassadorship, your vocation, your job, and your personality. But do it with the power and the authority that Christ has given to you in his resurrection. Because nothing can hold him back. Nothing can hold you back. Now one day, if the Lord tarries, you will die. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. 
But right now, how are we to walk in the newness of life? And the message to you and I today as we sit in this room is now go be who you're supposed to be. Because you have this identity in him. Israel, we took care of what needed to take care of. They remembered his words. Paul comes along and says, you know what the word of the Lord Jesus Christ is to you? You're my ambassador. I loved you. I died for you. I gave my life for you. I've blessed you with all spiritual blessings. I've made you complete in Christ. I've set you in the heavenly places. Now just go live for me and who you are in your time and in your place and go be my ambassador. What is the ambassador message? 1 Timothy 2.4 who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Can't get any easier than that. By the way, when they reject that, you know who they're rejecting? The administration. Yeah, but I hate that. I don't like it either, but guess who they're rejecting? Life. That message. I ought to look into it a little deeper. Dear Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we thank you for everything that we have in your Son. And as we look the rest of the morning here at different...